Hello everybody, welcome back. Today I want to go over the Elenco Radio Kit again, and this time I'm going to go over the AM detector in the circuit, as well as the AGC portion of the circuit. And we'll do the usual things, go over the theory, and then see if we can come up with the readings from the data sheet or the manual that we're supposed to see if everything's working according to theory and of course discuss some theory on how it is supposed to operate so let's go ahead and get started the first thing we want to look at is the detector this is the part of the circuit that will take our IF coming in from T8 secondary the IF and the audio and it's going to take that and make it into a pure audio tone at its output that we can use for to, to send to our audio amplifier. Now you can see that it's only par three parts. It's D4, so one diode, one resistor, and one capacitor. And that makes it really cheap, and it's, it's relatively simple to design. There are some compromises that you have to make, and we'll talk about those a little bit later. So the way this is going to work is we're going to take the IF signal at, plus the audio off, off of the secondary of T8 and we're going to send that through D4. Now D4 has already been turned on. We don't want to use any of the signal on the secondary of T8 to have to turn, the, turn D4 on because if we do we're going to lose part of the intelligence. It's going to clip the, the part of the audio signal potentially. So we put, make sure that this has uh, the turn on, the, the voltage necessary to turn itself on. And we can see that it does because if we follow our 9 volt line, you can see that it's going to go through R38, down through R35, and continue through R36, down through the circuit to this junction and we have a choice now or the voltage has a choice which way does it or current has a choice which way does it want to go do I want to go through D4 or do I want to go through this section it doesn't want to go through here because C38 is going to block it at this point and there's another capacitor at the output so the uh, uh, option is okay is this diode going to be forward biased yes it is because this is our 9 volt line so it's going to turn that diode on so this is just going to make sure that we don't clip any of the audio signal that's coming out so what we have at this output is a signal that looks like that. So we still have the IF, we still have the audio riding on top of it, and we want to eliminate the IF and keep only the audio. And that's what R42 and C38 are going to do for us. There are a couple of ways we can do an analysis of this circuit. Uh, a simple one and a quick one, down and dirty essentially, is just to look at what kind of capacitive reactants are we going to have on C38. So if I redraw the circuit quickly, so here's our diode D4, our resistor, and our capacitor. So let's look at it from the point of just frequencies. So we have, let's say we have two frequencies coming in uh, from our from T8 and we'll just say that the audio frequency is 5k Hertz which is the maximum we can have on AM and our IF of course is fi fixed at 455. So we have two frequencies an IF of 455 kilohertz and an audio frequency of 5k Hertz that's the highest it can be. So the signal goes through and right now we're ignoring time constants. We'll come back to those a little bit later. And we have a capacitor. So what happens on a capacitor with, with capacitive reactants? Xc is going to be 1 over 2 pi Fc. So this is going to be our variable, the frequency itself. So the higher the frequency goes, as frequency goes up, Xc goes down. And of course the opposite is true. When Fc goes down, or when F goes down, Xc goes up. So if we look at it from the point of the 455 k hertz, this capacitor and resistor pair, and let's again just look at the capacitor. This capacitor is going to see 455 k hertz, which is a relatively high frequency. It's the way it was designed, the selection of the components. 
it's a relatively high frequency, XC is going to be low, and that means no voltage is going to be developed across the capacitor. However, 5K hertz is a relatively low frequency. We're going to have a high XC, that means we're going to develop a lot of voltage across here, and we're going to be able to send that voltage out to our audio amplifier. So, low XC sends it to ground, low XC is going to occur with 455. High capacitive reactance is going to be 5K hertz, develop a lot of voltage here, and send the signal out. So we can do the same kind of analysis with time constants, and here's how that would work. So if you remember your AC, when we're dealing with time constants, one time constant was the amount of time it took to charge a capacitor to 63.2%. And as an arbitrary statement, and it's a fairly good one, if we had five time constants, we would consider the, the capacitor to be completely charged. So we'd be at, we'd be at on the order of 99 point something percent. So it would be a, a pretty good, a pretty good uh, charge on there. So the time constant for this circuit is calculated by R times C, and we get 2.2 K ohms times 0 0.01 microfarad. And that gives us a time of 22 microseconds. So that's the time constant of our circuit. What other two times do we have? We have to deal with the 455 kilohertz. The period of a 455 kilohertz sine wave, or any wave of 455 for that matter, is 2.197 microseconds. We're just going to call it 2.2 microseconds. The other time is our audio frequency. The maximum audio frequency that we can have is 5 kilohertz. And 5 kilohertz comes out to be 200 micro seconds. So now we have all of the times that we're going to be uh, that are going to be affecting our circuitry. So if we continue with our analysis, this 455 kilohertz is that's the period of our little of our pulses. This time constant, this time constant is long in comparison to the pulse width. So this is a long time constant and if you remember back again to your days with AC circuits, what's going to happen in a capacitor with a long, long time constant circuit is that the voltage on the cap is only going to go up very slightly before it drops down again back to zero. So we're never going to have any kind of appreciable voltage built up on the cap, in this case uh, C38, that is going to be sent to the output. However, when we look at this, this is a short time constant. And a, another way to look at long time constants and short time constants again is the, uh, in this case, the, the pulse is, is five times, or the, the time constant is five times longer than, than the actual pulse. And in this one, the, uh, th it's a short time constant circuit. And the pulse is, or the time constant is one-fifth of the pulse width. So in a short time constant circuit, what we will have at the output is a good charge on the capacitor. Because this, this pulse is present for such a long period of time, it can charge that capacitor completely. And given enough time, our five time constants, we would have A, way, a voltage on the cap that looks like that. So here's our charge time, and uh, you know if there's a uh, if the capacitors were even different, we could have a, a line that goes this long. But we will get a full com and complete charge, and then the circuit will shut off and it'll discharge at the same kind of rate. But we get a good voltage on the capacitor for our audio. Uh, the 5 kHz, but we get very little voltage because of the time constant involved at 455 kHz. So there's a way of looking at it with time constant. Hopefully that made some sense. So we can charge the capacitor with with this long with this uh, um, long pulse. We cannot charge the capacitors 
with this short pulse or capacitor and resistor pair. There's a compromise that we have to have when we select the value of the time constant of these circuits. And that's because there's no such thing as a perfect filter for this situation. Imagine us putting a square wave into our, our circuit. So we'll still use the regular carrier, our sine wave 455 kHz, and this is now our modulating signal. We would like to have absolutely vertical uh, output waves on our, our signal when it's demodulated. And of course everything uh, nice and vertical for a square wave uh, on this portion. Well the problem is that we're dealing with capacitors and they have time constants. If we make the time constant such that the capacitor has ch time to charge to the 455k and it's going to do that no matter what so we have to select uh, whatever the values of our you know for our resistor and capacitor are uh, knowing that our capacitor is going to charge to or a in, in, in time with that 455k hertz so we're going to end up with ripple on that input we are also going to have a time when if we make the time constant really long that the capacitor will discharge too slowly and we are going to end up with some negative clipping. So there's no perfect world in which we just get exactly the same square wave in that we had out. So in this example I, I took this my uh, modulated signal uh, modulated carrier and you can see that the result this is the original signal in green and this is our modulated carrier when we separate the two we are going to have ripple we are going to have negative clipping and there's just nothing that we can do about it we can change those resistors and the capacitor and what that will do is if we tr if we try to get the ripple out we'll make the clipping too bad <laughs> if we try to take the clipping out we can make the ripple too bad so we have to find some compromise where we're comfortable with the result either way. And for that purpose, I actually built a little circuit that I'm going to input a square wave into. And I've taken a decade box, and I've taken a couple of resistors, or a resistor. In this case, it's a 1K, 100K, and a little uh, 1N914 diode and I'm going to apply a square wave to it and we're going to take a look at that output and see how the diode detector or the uh, envelope detector doesn't work. I never did mention how we how why they call it an envelope detector. What they're looking at as far as the envelope is concerned and we'll go back to the manual for the from the Elenco uh, radio. The envelope is what the IF is sandwiched into and the, so they, they decided hey, that's uh, let's call that an envelope so whatever the IF is in that's the envelope so what we're interested in detecting is the envelope itself not the IF hence envelope detector all right long story short so let's go ahead and, and test this little circuit out and then we'll go into the AGC and see about uh, you know the theory of operation there and and test it as well the circuit is now hooked up so let's take a look at everything on the screen. And you can see that I have a sine wave coming in for my carrier. So we're looking at 30 kHz, 5 volts peak to peak. And I am modulating the signal with 200 Hz internally at 90% depth. On the scope, you can see what looks like a, uh, a pretty distorted sine wave output and that's true because the diode is going to need seven tenths of a volt for it to turn on so if I go back to the sine wave and do an offset and I add seven tenths of a volt negative you can see now that the sine wave looks a lot better. There's still a problem because there's the IF and you can see all of the, uh, the little pulses that are going into it. 
So this is just as a sine wave, and it doesn't look too bad, but we're not filtering out the, the intermediate frequency perfectly. I'm going to change the modulation now to be a square wave, and also change it to where we just have a AC input so I can get the signal to be a little bit larger and spread that out and you can definitely see now that we have a little bit of a, of a delay in our square wave going vertical and we have a lot of the IF signal still getting through our circuit. So if I change my capacitor and let's change it to 2 nanofarad. So if we compare the two, notice that here's our, here's our current slope. Here's our current IF. So we are looking at approximately at 500 millivolts peak, about 700 millivolts for the IF signal. And the slope is about, you know, if we just pick a, per, pick a point and we'll say we're going to use that one right there. It looks like it's about 1.5 divisions at 100 microseconds, so 150 microseconds. If I now go to 20 nanofarad, and see if I can get it to trigger again, notice that where we had a uh, rather substantial value for the IF, it's quite a bit lower now, but our slope has gotten worse. It was on the order of what, well, one, 150 or so, and now it looks like it's almost double that. So let's try, and before I zero it out, you see now the slope is better, but the IF is worse. So no matter what combination you use for capacitors and resistors, there's the trade-off that you have to make. Now for a square wave, you know, that's, this is in the extreme. You'll never see this, uh, well, you, you, you won't have to deal with it quite so much, obviously, on a, on a sine wave, but the effect is still there. It's still going to have the same set of problems. You know, you can make it big enough that you get rid of all of the IF, and now I'm at 105. Yeah, if you can see that, get it into focus. And the IF is practically gone, but the original audio is, is so distorted that it's, it's not even worth it. Well, in this case, audio is, is really a suspect word <laughs> since we're dealing with square waves. So that selection of those two resistors is what do you need as far as eliminating the IF or reproduction of the audio. Pick one. And, uh, you know, roll the dice and see what happens. Let's take a look at the automatic gain control. The job of the AGC is to make sure that the signal that is being sent to the amplifier stages here and farther down are at a constant level. You don't want to be moving in the vehicle, for example, and the signal of your AM station is changing constantly. The amp its amplitude is changing and you don't want the signal to be louder and then lower uh, as you go over terrain. So this simple circuit is designed to make sure that that value is constant. The way it does it, it also takes the signal off of the secondary of PA through the diode, which means that it's going to cut off the positive half of, of our wave uh, with the IF and the audio, and the negative half of the IF and audio signal is going to be fed back to the base of Q8. And the reason that we feed that voltage back is we have a, a positive voltage on the base of Q8. And the idea is that if the signal gets larger, so we d start to sending a larger signal through the circuit, the larger IF, the larger negative IF signal gets here, it's going to take that negative voltage in, and apply it to the positive voltage from, that's always there from this voltage divider. That's going to cause the drive on this circuit to go down, lower the output of the signal, and try to keep it constant. And it does a fairly good job in, in doing so. We have this low pass filter consisting of C32 and R36, and C32 is a 10 microfarad cap, so it's a 
it's a, it's a very large capacitor in our circuit. And the resistor is 3.3 K ohms. So if we again calculate the time constant, we're going to find that this is going to be 33 milliseconds. So that's far longer a time than the audio is going to be applied or is going to be going into this. Remember we had our, when we had a 5 kHz signal, the period of our wave was 200 microseconds. And if we go down to 1 kHz, of course, we're now at 1 millisecond. And if we start going even smaller, let's say 100 Hz, we're still only at 10 milliseconds. So this time constant is extremely, extremely long. And we're not going to reproduce any audio with it, but what we will get is an average output of the amplitude of this negative going audio voltage. So it's going to kind of average what the negative, uh, negative audio signal is, and it's going to apply that negative average to the base of this transistor. So the voltage on this transistor is fixed by a DC voltage. So we have 9 volts applied. We're going through R38, which is 100 ohms. So if we do a calculation for that, we'll find we have a 100 ohm resistor in R38. The next component that we're going to go through in our 9 volt line, supply line, is going through R35, which is 27 K ohms. Now we should put that right there, 27 K ohms. And then the next component is R36, and that's 3.3 K ohms. And it's across that 3.3 K ohm resistor that we're actually going to develop the the base voltage for the transistor. So if we just do it as a as a voltage divider by a circuit, which is what it is, so it's our 3.3 K ohms divided by the sum of all of the resistors in the path and that'll give us the voltage on the base with one caveat with one warning so of course we have to multiply it by whatever the applied voltage is that one that caveat is if we go farther through the circuit r36 so there's our voltage divider 36 35 38 we have to find the ground side of the circuit, so we'll travel through this the rest of the way, and lo and behold, we end up on the diode. And we all know that a diode voltage, uh, the diode is going to take its voltage first, and whatever is left is going to give us uh, the resistance of, of the circuit to give us the current. So we're definitely going to have to take into account that we're dropping about seven-tenths of a volt on this diode. So with not, we know we have nine volts applied, and if I drop seven-tenths, my multiplier is 8.3 volts and that should be and that and if I do the all the math I should get the voltage on the base well the math gives me a value of it gives me a, gives me a base voltage of 900 millivolts well where's the rest of it where's the rest of the voltage well it's that diode and if we add that 0 0.7 volts my base voltage should be approximately 1.6 volts. And that'll keep that circuit on all the time. So what the AGC will do when the voltage starts to become more negative, we're going to take a negative voltage off of uh, this junction, average it out over here, and then apply that negative voltage to the base of the transistor. So if the signal gets to be too high, instead of having 1.6 just from the divider network, we're going to have 1.6 minus whatever the average value of that is. So let's say it's, you know, 0.1 volt. And it's going to be DC for all practical purposes because that capacitor is so large it's going to act like a, a little bit like a, a regulator. Well, it is a regulator. So now we end up with 1.5 volts on the base. That's decreasing the drive voltage for Q8. If the drive voltage decreases, it's going to have less to amplify and then we're going to be feeding less signal farther down and then we can start either increasing or decreasing the uh, the feedback voltage here again accordingly. So it's a pretty fast circuit, it reacts quickly and, and, it, and it works quite well. So let's take a look at uh, some, some experimentation and see how uh, all of this is going to work together.
The first check that we're asked to do in the manual is a static power measurement of test point 5. And of course, test point 5 is the AGC that's going to the base of Q8. And the schematic is a little bit better to, to see that. So here's your test point 5 and base of Q8. So what we're looking at is a the voltage that's from the diode. Remember, we should have about seven tenths of a volt there and some voltage here and that'll give us the total voltage on the base. So we should have, according to the manual, uh, 1.5 volts DC uh, plus or minus half a volt. And I've already hooked it up. The power supply is going, so you can see the hookups. And we have 1.4611 volts. Let's go ahead and take a look at this circuit a little bit more. And of course, hit the clear button, not the log button. So 1.46 volts. And if I measure just the base voltage from the resistor, which would be R36, if I can get it to stay, I have 9144, so I'm going to subtract that, minus 0.9144. And that leaves 0.5456. And if I measure the diode drop now, and lo and behold, the voltage is 5458, and the voltage we had was 5456. So spot on. So now you see that we do have to include that diode voltage in there. The next step is to measure the power supply, to, well, to make for sure that we have 9 volts on the circuit. And a relatively simple check. So we're just going to ground at test point 15, and we are going to test point 3. And it's just making sure that we have the 9 volt power supply hooked up, and we do. So we're moving along pretty well. Now we can go ahead and see how the AM detector is actually working, or if it is working. And we're going to do that by, we're going, by inputting a 455 kHz signal here and adjusting its amplitude. And we're going to see at what point we start measuring a change at, I believe, test point 5. So let's see what happens there. I have the voltmeter hooked up to test point 5, that's this lead, and here's the input from my function generator. One of the things that you'll have to do is you have to put a capacitor on test point 3 because that's your 9 volts and you don't want to feed that into your function generator. It's in the instructions in the manual and right now you can see I have 1.4594 volts and my output is, is pretty small. We're just looking at at 2 millivolts peak to peak from the generator at this point. So 1.4594. So I'll start to adjust this voltage and as soon as we see a change here uh, from the voltage adjustment on the function generator, that's the sensitivity of the AGC. So going up now, so, and I'm gonna actually let it get down, you know, let it change down to the uh, to the millivolt range because it'll change pretty fast. Uh, so we'll let it change to the millivolt range. So we'll, what we'll look for is 1.458. And we adjust it up. And there we go. 1.458. So it's only a few hundred microvolts of change, and the sensitivity that it took to do that was 51 millivolts peak to peak from the from the function generator. So we need to mark that number down for a, a later reference. So our AGC sensitivity is 51 millivolts peak to peak from the 455 kHz sine wave. Once it starts getting that big, we start getting AGC and our 
our voltage is just going to start going down and decrease the drive. So next thing is AM detector bandwidth. I almost forgot one check. Uh, they do want us to see if dot D4 is actually working as a detector. And to do that, we just need to input a signal, uh, turn the volume all the way up on our, on our radio. And if we hear a tone, well, then we know that diode D4 is working. If you don't hear that tone, then you have a problem. So we can actually take some signal out. And I don't know if you can hear it, but it, I, can, I can barely make it out. But it is there at 31 millivolts peak to peak. Uh, probably can't pick it up on the mic. So now we can do the detector bandwidth test. To check the AM detector bandwidth, we want to set this scope to have a, an amplitude uh, from, the, from, the, from the radio of 400 millivolts peak to peak. And we're going to adjust the modulating signal until we get down to 70.7 percent point. So the first step is adjust for a proper output and see if we can get this triggered nicely and we still got a little bit of noise. A lot of that is uh, I thought was you know from my DC power supply but it turns out well it's nowhere in this building that I can find uh, but it was being picked up by the the, the ground plane in the radio. So if I sh take the ground plane and, and put it at earth ground, it takes care of a lot of the, a lot of the noise. And here's an example of me not doing that. So you can see how much signal that ground plane is picking up. Uh, none of the other circuits seem to do it that I've been working on uh, quite as badly. So I'm going to go with that. Anyway, so I have one, two, three, four divisions. And now I'm going to take the modulation and adjust it to where I have 2.8 volts peak to peak. So on my function generator I have 2.391 that's the voltage that was required to get me the the four, uh, 100 millivolts peak to peak. So I'll take the modulation frequency and I'm now going to adjust that and I'll do it by 100s and what I'm looking for is that point where it gets to 2.280 millivolts peak to peak. And I'll go put the camera back down here. And we're definitely getting a little smaller. I'm at 7.6 kilohertz right now. And if I adjust the scope and just met doing the old manual measurements, so 100, 200, and looks like about 2.4, uh, 2.8 divisions. So it's right about there. So we're looking at a bandwidth of about 7.6 kHz. And if, if we want to find the critical frequency, if we didn't do that already, we can just take... 1 divided by 2 pi RC and the RC components are the 2.2 K ohm and the 0.01 microfarad. So we came up with about 7.6 so getting our handy dandy calculating device And that's microfarad, so negative sixth times two times pi. And then taking the reciprocal of that and 7.2. So uh, yeah, I, I think we already did that, but guess what? It's still good. So it looks like uh, calculation and uh, practical expectation all, all came together. Practical expectation. <laughs> the, the results were right. Well, thank you for joining me once again for another video. I hope that it all made sense to you and hope you learned something. And remember, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. And the more of this you know, the, the more attractive you become to the significant other in your life. Well, all joking aside, uh, thank you for your time. And I will see you again soon uh, where we will discuss the second IF amplifier and where we will start getting into the transformers in, in the unit and uh, move on from there.